All right. Well, I'm going to get things going. Hello, everybody. This is Greg Warner. I am uh, really thrilled to have this webinar and see so many people attending. And wow, it's the attendance rate is really high. Usually we only get about 50% of people to attend. And now it looks like it's almost like 80, 85, maybe even 90%. So that's terrific. So let's get jumping right in here. I know your time is very valuable and you want to learn a lot. And I've got a, a ton to tell you and teach you. So thank you so much for joining me. And uh, that's me. I'm Greg Warner. I'm the CEO and founder of Market Smart and the inventor of Survey Gift Maker, which is the product that I'm going to talk about at the very end. I don't want to turn this into a big sales pitch, but if you stay um, after, and I'll warn you when I'm going to talk about what we do uh, so that you can jump if you don't want to um, hear what could be construed as a sales pitch. Okay, so I'm going to review uh, our mission real quick. I think it's very important that folks understand what our mission is here at Market Smart. And it's to be the worldwide leader in providing technologies that help nonprofits increase their revenues, increase their revenues, I'll say again, and decrease their costs while also helping their supporters accomplish their goals. So this is really, really important to me that the, uh, and it's funny because when I started this, I told people that's my mission and uh, people didn't believe that it could be done. They said, you can't increase revenues and decrease costs. Well, I I think we've proved them wrong and proved us right. And uh, additionally, helping supporters accomplish their goals, it's, it's just so rare uh, that we see a nonprofit that includes the supporters in their mission statement, yet they pay for everything. So um, I think it's important that we include the supporters in our mission statement. And, and in fact, a lot of what I'm building and developing in terms of technology is, um, is really for the benefit of the donors, because if you treat them well, they'll give more. One other thing uh, or little things about me um, and my firm is that we've delivered literally millions of surveys on, uh, on behalf of our clients. We've generated hundreds of thousands of highly qualified leads for fundraisers. That's the key is, is you want qualified leads. You don't want to spend time on fishing expeditions. So uh, that's what we've done. And also uncovered uh, almost 10,000 hidden bequests that weren't previously known to fundraisers. Now, a lot of our work has been done and has has has. Uh, with the benefit of my uh, relationship with Dr. Russell James, who I believe and many believe is the foremost researcher in this space. Um, also, one of my best friends in the whole wide world, Adam Weinstein, uh, runs a company called Full Circle Research, which if you've ever seen um, uh, something pop up online that says, you know, take surveys, get money. And this is really for the private sector. Uh, so uh, if you've ever seen those ads pop up, take surveys, get money, you know, get paid to take surveys, things like that. He's actually... Um, uh, running that firm now, and he uh, was my roommate in college. How about that? And we both ended up in the survey business, uh, although I, my firm does a heck of a lot more than that, and his is really just doing surveys for companies like Nestle and GM and um, you know Amazon and things like that. Okay, and then uh, the third person is um, a friend of mine named Richard Shapiro, who wrote the book on uh, uh, customer service. Frankly, it's, uh, his book is called the Engage uh, the Endangered Customer, and he's done uh, lots of research in that space. And he runs something called the Center for uh, Customer Retention. So customer retention is a lot like donor retention, and uh, the same principles actually apply. So these are some of my helpers, if you will. We've got hundreds of clients around the world. We're in four countries. Uh, you'll probably recognize some of these, uh, some of these organizations or many of these organizations. But since this is a webinar about um, uh, colleges and universities and how to raise money for you, uh, I just uh, thought we'd put some of the logos of some of our friends. We actually signed up, I think, six colleges and universities already this month. So uh, really happy to see that that ball is rolling uh, rather rather at a brisk pace. Okay, so today we're going to uh, take the briefest history 
lesson ever on surveys because frankly, I couldn't find that much uh, history, but what I found was pretty interesting. We're gonna talk about why you wanna do this um, thankfully, it's neat. I see a lot of our clients are online. Uh, they know the drill, but I guess they want to learn more, which is fantastic. So hopefully we'll get some great questions um, and maybe they can even help out. We'll go through the, the basics of surveys uh, because it, what I'm really trying to do here is I'm, I'm going to try and teach you everything that you, you need to do this on your own. Um, and then I'm going to show you um, some low cost ways to do it at the very end in case uh, you don't have a very big budget. Uh, so we'll be talking about strateg strategies and tactics and best practices and show you some case studies. Then I'll go through, I'll give you a warning. I'll tell you when we're going to talk about Market Smart and our products and services. And you can jump at that point. And then we'll go to, uh, I mean, unless you want to hear about them, of course, which I hope you will. And then we'll go to questions and answers. All right, here's the briefest history of surveys ever. Charles the Great supposedly, from what I could find, uh, created the first survey, uh, the Survey of the Kingdom in Western Europe in the year 771. Now, what's amazing about this is this question that I found that that, that he used is not all that um, not all that surprising that there would be uh, disputes of property in the kingdom, of course. But what was more amazing was that they were wondering he was trying to figure out why people are refusing to offer shelter to refugees. And he also included a question about why people were refusing to join the military to defend the borders. I guess he, he didn't think about building a wall, but it just fascinated me that uh, 1,300 years ago, uh, people were still dealing with this problem. So I don't mean to get political on everybody, but I was just fascinated that this is these are among the questions that, that were in that first survey. Unbelievable. All right, so the private sector, as all of you probably know, leads the field when it comes to surveys. All right, so I just bought my son, turned 16, just, and I bought him a little uh, Ford Fusion. What a great car, by the way. Love this car. He's going to, uh, now he's actually literally um, beating the pavement looking for a job today, or he better be, because he's got to help me pay it off. That's part of the deal. Anyway, as soon as we finished, uh, they asked us to take a survey. And I'm sure if you bring your car in anywhere or you buy a car, you've seen these kinds of surveys. Um, I'm not going to go through all these. I, I'm just trying to give you an idea and, and bring to your attention that we get surveyed all the time. People get surveyed all the time. The private sector loves it, uh, loves it. Now, this one I will walk you through real quick because some of this is going to resonate later on, but this is from Apple, and of course, Apple's fantastic, and I, I had a great experience on, on telephone support, and Brianna helped me, and I was so happy that I thought, well, I'm going to take the survey. I'm going to let them know how happy I am. So I was very satisfied with uh, with their with the experience. My issue was resolved. Um, the advisor, Brianna, her commitment to resolving my issue was uh, was what influenced this satisfaction level, uh, and so on. You know, she was knowledgeable. She cared for me. She listened, she was helpful, good communication skills. I'm hoping your donors feel the same way about you. She was, um, uh, oh, okay, how likely am I to recommend Apple Care support? You know, so of course we want our donors to refer us to family members or friends, especially if they are uh, high capacity donors, they probably have friends that are in similar circles. Um, just a little bit more information here about what I did before seeking her help. Some tools I used. I was on a community forum online. It didn't work for me. That's why I ended up getting in there with her. And then I filled out the open box. Great job, right? So I hope all of you have taken a survey, and if you haven't recently, go ahead and take it because it's good to feel what that experience is like 
so that you, when you're creating your survey, can, can be more donor centric. Um, just a real brief, I'm going to show you a whole bunch of flashes of other surveys. I mean, this is Geek Squad, which is part of Best Buy. Uh, I've gotten them in the mail. This is our heating and air conditioning company. Let's see what else we've got here. My bank. Um, I stated a Hyatt. Yes. Uh, LinkedIn, of course. I even get them from AT&T on my phone. How about that? They text me. And this is from a, a online printing company, Vista Vista Print. Okay, so clearly the private sector understands the value of surveys and their importance for retaining customers and saving customers because a, a customer that is saved from going away is much much more loyal. So collecting information and being able to find out when people are upset is, is very powerful for, for building loyalty. So surveys uh, benefit you because they give you the opportunity to collect information. Uh, now, where I really see this helping, especially major gifts, and uh, and plan gifts is in the donor discovery process because of course with with direct response marketing and fundraising um, there's really not that much donor discovery that's going to happen uh, it's pretty much you send out the letters the emails and and then there's uh, there's going to be response uh, with the major gift fundraising it's more about understanding the the passions and interests of the donor uh, conducting that donor discovery to so that you can align their interests with uh, offers, if you will, uh, that you can deliver um, uh, as, as um, satisfactory uh, uh, giving opportunities. So conducting the donor discovery uh, episode in the relationship is very time consuming and, uh, and an expensive, uh, it, albeit necessary, part of the cultivation process and qualification process. It's just that at, in these days and in line with my mission statement, I'm trying to help you uh, generate more money at lower costs. So what, what, what I recommend is the survey to help you conduct the donor discovery. Now, of course, there's no substitute for face-to-face -face engagements. It's just that they are expensive. So to be able to conduct donor discovery um, uh, through a marketing channel is very efficient and effective. And this can um, accentuate your prospect research, of course. It's also going to enable you to be much, much more donor centric because you'll understand uh, who cares about what and how they want to be um, uh, spoken to and, and communicated with and so on. But even bigger than just collecting information, the survey can help you uh, really generate leads. I'm talking highly qualified leads and they, and, and they can help you uncover hidden legacy gifts. And then as you collect all this information, you'll be able to, um, uh, even with a simple Excel file, you'll be able to sort the leads and the respondents so that you can qualify them. But what's really cool about surveys is that people who lean in and take the time to take the survey are actually qualifying themselves they're saying just by completing the survey that they care that much more. So self-qualification is really important. And when people self-qualify, it helps you to build and reorganize your caseloads. Um, frankly, the donors are putting themselves on your caseload. And this helps you manage your time much better. The whole thing is, is about saving you time uh, because time is money. So th those are quite a bunch of benefits. Uh, the, in the end, of course, you want to generate money. <laughs> you want to generate money. And it, by collecting information about each supporter's needs, you begin to understand why they care and what their interests are 
so that you can be more relevant, more contextual and personalized and deliver the right offers to people at the right time. And the timing is all dependent on where they are in the consideration process. And we'll, we'll, we'll go into this a little bit later. But um, uh, sometimes the kind of offer that you might want to present to someone might be simply for engagement. For instance, someone who's not ready to make a gift perhaps might appreciate an offer that's purely a digital version of a yearbook. That would be a great offer. But someone who's at the uh, deep in the consideration stage and ready to take action is probably going to want to look at an offer that's more like a proposal or a tour or a visit to see where their name could be on a building. That's a much different type of offer uh, that is more appropriate for uh, that stage of the consideration process. Uh, the other thing about uh, surveys, and this is somewhat anecdotal because it's hard for us to get the information from our clients, but we do hear stories all the time that um, respondents of the surveys end up either giving more that year and or they end up giving uh, right then. In other words, they'll, they'll, after they take the survey, they're feel, feeling really good about stuff. So if they're online, they'll go uh, and donate. And if they took a, um, a print survey, they'll include a, a check. Sometimes I've heard as much as $25,000 coming in the mail. Unbelievable, uh, but happening. And also I've heard that people get more uh, kind of a bump in donor advised fund gifts after the survey goes out. So um, uh, I don't generally, uh, by the way, recommend that you just sit there and, and assume that you're going to get tons and tons of dollars. But generally, our clients, um, uh, whatever the cost of the survey is, ends up paying for itself and then some. Uh, so, so it's really a zero cost game uh, to do a survey because usually the amount of money you get immediately uh, pays for itself. If any of our clients are online and they want to, you know, share some of those stories, um, please, uh, you know, feel free to type that in. Okay. So, um, and, and I'll just share them if somebody does. Now, there's really four reasons I've come across of why nonprofits don't conduct surveys. And it usually has to do with the fact that they don't have the time uh, they don't have the expertise, meaning that they don't really know what questions to ask, what words to use, how to design them, um, how to how to how to get high completion rates, um, and so on. Also, they don't have the technologies in house, and learning how to use other technologies are uh, often kind of uh, you know there's a learning curve with that. And then the biggest reason I think, although sometimes this is unspoken, it, are the internal politics because the, the minute that you decide that you want to do a survey, it may be that other departments start to say, well, hold on, we want to do one. And then, you know, and of course yours, the purpose of yours is to try and raise lots and lots of money. And then the purpose of somebody else's might be because they want to understand why their uh, failing event is failing. <laughs> you know, and uh, this, uh, w wasting your, your capital, I shouldn't say it's complete waste, but expending your capital, so to speak, of, uh, you know, an email blast where, where you can't blast people too much or, or sending them too much mail uh, on trying to prop up a failing proposition or just learning about your brand or something like that is not going to raise a lot of money. So um, it, there may be silos, there may be competition in-house uh, for for space on the survey, uh, or there just might be a whole bunch of arguments that uh, although uh, maybe no one on staff is actually an expert in it, people will argue about what they think are the right ways to ask questions and what words to use and so on. So this could thwart uh, attempts to conduct surveys. All right. So I'm going to jump into uh, some basics about surveys, really lay down uh, a foundation here to help you uh, understand uh, how to how to do them. I'm going to lay down. Uh, yeah, the foundation is probably the best way to to say it. So the um, uh, the thing is, firstly, that everybody benefits from feedback. We all need feedback. Um, there's a, what's his name? Sparrow, uh, 
Captain Sparrow, I forget the movie, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, you know. So he uses a compass, right? That's good for feedback. It helps him get where he needs to go. You've got children always need feedback in the terms of grades. Uh, athletes might get timed or they'll videotape their golf swing and whatnot to see how they're doing and they'll watch videotape and uh, employees are getting evaluated. They get feedback. Everybody needs feedback. Oh, politicians too, right? They get feedback in, 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 in well, votes and in polls. Um, the four ways that nonprofits generally get feedback are, well, begin with complaints. And uh, although sometimes this is good, uh, and but it's often the worst way to to really take you don't want to take too much action from some complaints because it's not really um uh it's not data <laughs> you know so i've heard so many stories of uh executive directors or vps ceos even top level people who hear one complaint from one person and they decide to change all the plans that they had, or they, they create edicts and say, well, we're not sending out emails like that, or we're not going to send out letters like that anymore. And the vast majority of people may not complain. And in fact, appreciate and like what they were getting, but then one or two small um, squeaky grease, squeaky wheels uh, end up getting the grease. And I don't recommend using that in, in order to make big decisions. Polls are another way that's very rarely used, frankly, in nonprofits. So I'll just speed by that. But um, then, then you may get these reviews from um, uh, these charity watchdogs, which uh, I, you know we can all kind of groan about a little bit here and there. And then, uh, and then come surveys. Uh, so I, 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 of course, I'm a biased, but I think surveys are the best ways to get feedback from your supporters. And I don't think you can survey people too much. I mean, not every day. But um, with surveys, you end up with data. And data is powerful. It really stops people in their tracks showing a chart or, or a graph or stat, st stats. And st have it, they, they end those boardroom arguments um, because it's really hard to argue with the data, especially if it's coming directly from your donors. Uh, one interesting thing that I'm constantly uh, hearing, even just yesterday, someone uh, mentioned that they thought that um, older people do not engage online and would not respond to a digital survey. So uh, now, of course, I'm a big believer, huge believer in direct mail. It's very powerful and very effective. But um, I'm, uh, I have to tell you, the data is, is there that older people are, are online and they are responsive to digital outreach. So what's cool about this chart is, and we're showing in the nice sweet spot, 60 to 69, 70s, even in the 80s, we're seeing people who are digitally responsive, which remember, not everybody's going to be digitally responsive, but if you can generate awesome, highly qualified leads of high capacity um, uh, supporters online at a teeny tiny fraction of the cost of other channels, I'd say it's worth it. I really think it's worth it to use the digital channel. And what's even more fascinating about this is that, so if you add up these three, I mean, 70s, 80s, and 90s, um, if you add that up, that makes up 39% of, of the respondents to the digital outreach. In 2015, though, this was 29.2%. So uh, only two years later, uh, we're, we're seeing a lot more people, uh, older people, I should say, engaging with digital. I think a lot of this has to do with the use of, of tablets and um, uh, while people are just moving into, you know, baby boomers are moving into that category. And uh, also the need to see children, grandchildren and so on through Skype and, and, and so on is, is, is a very powerful motivator for getting people to learn how to use use uh, uh, digital media. So um, when you hear people proclaim certain things, I, I recommend using data um, instead of anecdotal evidence to make sure uh, that you're staying on the right track. Um, now, 
people take another objection I get is people say, well, I would never take that. I would never take that survey. I would never do this. I, I'm not a survey taker, so I can't believe that anybody would ever take. Well, I got to be honest with you. People take surveys and they take them a lot. And, and that's saying that, that, that people don't take surveys is, is, or you wouldn't do it. It's kind of like watching TV commercials and you, you look at them and you say, well, I'll never buy that product. I would never advertise because it doesn't work. Well, but somehow it's working because a lot of people are still advertising on TV and even banner ads and so on. Um, so people take surveys because they're passionate about a product and they they want to provide feedback. They want to change. They want to make an impact. They want to be heard. And uh, people generally want to be helpful, especially to the brands and organizations and institutions that they love. Now, the least I I I important reason why they might take it is if they're interested in the topic. Um, that means they're just kind of poking and prodding. And uh, but but it could be that, for instance, uh, we do a capital campaign. F we we help with feasibility studies. Our surveys for the purpose of developing a, or uh, conducting a feasibility study helps round out the results for the board in their decision to um, uh, decide whether or not to go forward with a capital campaign. And in that uh, respect, we may say in the survey that, hey, this is exactly for that purpose, to decide whether or not to go forward with the campaign. And that can garner some interest among the, uh, the, the prospects that we're hoping will take it. So that's not, that's not a bad thing if they're, if they're interested in the topic. Now, some, uh, some negatives here are the tire kickers, if you will, the people who are only curious to see what questions we ask and uh, the ones that want to get some kind of incentive. We never recommend offering any kind of incentive whatsoever uh, for people to f uh, complete a survey. No, 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 no. Don't do that because uh, then uh, too many people will only fill it out just to get the incentive. And uh, we want passionate supporters. Remember, this is a self-qualification tool for building caseloads, essentially. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna charge on. We've got so much to cover, and I I want to try. I I know I'm shoving a lot at you, but hope you can take it. Uh, I'm gonna move fast. The uh, the way to get the best results is to be strategic. Okay, a lot of times people want to go off and fire off their tactics and do something before they step back and think about how they're how they're going to do it. It's always better to uh, do ready, aim, fire instead of fire, aim, ready, something like that. So first, you want to determine what is really your objective. In this case, I'm going to talk to you about uh, trying to raise money at lower costs. But if your objective is that you're trying to learn about your brand perception or something. That's important to understand because everything falls uh, falls down from there. Everything cascades from there. Uh, you're going to want to consider who are the stakeholders internally and externally for this, and then you're going to develop a plan based on that. It's ultimately key that you're donor centric and that you are limiting the questions and only asking uh, the ones that you need to complete your objective. Okay, don't throw every question in there and the kitchen sink. It's also important to be really upfront and honest. Um, if, you, if you can, for instance, explain how long it might take or at least use a progress bar so people get a sense of how long it'll take and uh, perhaps explain why you selected them to participate in the survey. Honesty is always the best policy. Uh, using simple words and short sentences, stay away from jargon, especially if you're um, trying to find out about likelihood for uh, considering a, a planned gift. I would not use the word bequest. Uh, I wouldn't use words that are jargony or legalistic. Uh, put away your legalese. And believe it or not, even though these folks are college graduates, I mean that most of your supporters will be, I would, I would imagine, I recommend speaking to everyone, including rocket scientists at NASA, because I wrote the case for the American Institute of Physics, and we wrote it on a fifth grade level. 
Okay, always make it simple. This is one of the first things I ever learned when I when I um, worked for an ad agency back in 1988. So uh, keep it simple. There's never any reason to overcomplicate things. It just makes it. It's it's about donor donor centricity and being uh, fair for your supporters. Okay, making it easy also relates to how you design your survey. Now we've tested and tested and tested the designs, and we've used heat mapping online to see where people's cursors go. And but there's some basic principles about just keeping it clean and and having a, a very clean design. And I'll show you examples of that in a little bit. Use big fonts. Use sans serif fonts. These fonts right here that you're looking at on my screen are sans serif. That's fancy French for uh, there are no doohickeys. <laughs> like the New York Times is written with serifs. Uh, that, that kind of font has little doohickeys at the end of every, every part of every letter. You know, sans serif fonts, especially online, are much easier. Now in print, in print, I highly recommend you use serif fonts. Okay, big buttons, things like that uh, are very, very easy to see. Um, use dark letters over white paper or white screens. Do not use reverse type. That's like white lettering over a black or a colored screen or, or sheet of paper. It's very hard to read, especially if you're trying to target older folks. Um, finally, for this, you don't want to drive people into a brick, brick wall, so to speak. So if you ask a question, uh, asking people their likelihood to want to volunteer, for instance, uh, you really better at the end or, or, or when you follow up with phone calls, really have an opportunity for people to volunteer. Don't ask them the question that is simply going to drive them into a, a, a brick wall. But if you're just trying to understand the, the level of interest in it uh, to determine if you should create volunteering opportunities, then explain that in the question. But don't lead people on to think that they'll be able to volunteer because of uh, the way you ask the question and then you're really driving them to a brick wall. The other thing, and this, this just pains me to no end, is if you do a survey, be ready to call people and respond to them. They're engaging with you. They're going to pour their hearts out in some instances. They'll be so happy to hear from you after they've responded to the survey. So don't leave them uh, sort of hanging. Uh, if you leave them hanging uh, and let those leads die on the vine, it's just not really, it's just not nice. And plus, it's a big waste of time and money. Okay. So... Another thing that we'll hear is that the um, uh, the fact uh, I shouldn't say it's a fact. In fact, is some people will say in your office we did a survey at one point and it didn't work. Now nine out of ten times uh, this ha has happened for two reasons. One is because they did a really poor job in, in, in creating the survey and everything that goes along with it, from the design, the questions, um, and, and so on. The second reason is because they picked um, a bad list. So uh, generally, I have uh, we've never seen a survey that really hasn't worked. We've even had one or two where we had a, just a terrible list that was filled with uh, non-usable emails and things like that. And even with some tweaks and talking to their data people, we, we've always been able to make it work if they'll let us help. So uh, I, I've just, I mean, unless people hate your organization, which I can't believe because you wouldn't be working there. It's going to work. Works every time. Um, so talking about it, completion rates, you've got to be really smart if you want to get a high completion rate. Um, branding your survey, making sure that people feel safe in, in knowing that it's really you who's talking to them. Uh, don't just send a, a you know, black and white letter with no branding and, and then just in small type it says that it's from your university. Uh, a lot of research firms will do this uh, because, well, they, they want to look like they're a third party 
and that they're acting on, on your behalf. But that actually reduces um, um, uh, completion rates because people don't want to talk to a research firm necessarily. Uh, oftentimes, they actually really want to talk to you and they want to give you the information. And, and none of the surveys I showed you earlier at the beginning were from a research firm. They were all from the brand. Now, I'm going to uh, take a step and er answer Eric's question. I'm going to save most of the questions for the end. Uh, but Eric was asking, how do you respond to donors who say that the survey isn't scientific and therefore the info obtained is invalid? So it's a waste of the organization's time and money. Well, I'll give you the response. Number one, Thankfully, of course it isn't scientific. The purpose of the survey is not to do a science experiment. The purpose of the survey is to help a, a staff at a nonprofit or institution um, to zero in on the most passionate supporters with the highest amount of capacity so that the organization spends as little money as possible spamming and berating and, and cold calling and, and junk mailing people who are not interested in, in having a deeper relationship with you, the fundraiser, or the institution. This is a very, very important point. Not everybody wants to have a relationship with you, no offense. <laughs> what we want to do is we want to find people who do want to have a relationship with you. That is the key. And if a, a donor calls and asks that kind of question, uh, then you've got to be upfront and honest and explain to them that all of this is to be better stewards of their money. It's to drastically reduce the cost of fundraising and exponentially increase the revenues on their behalf. That's why you're doing it. And if they don't agree with that, then I, 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 I can't imagine that they're truly a, a very um, uh, passionate supporter. All right. Hopefully that answered the question. Um, okay. So say that your voice matters May, or, or in some way say that to them. Make sure that it says it in your email or at the top, the beginning of the survey. Make sure that they understand. And it really better matter. You know, don't take the results of the survey and put them in a drawer. People are taking time out of their lives to answer you, so you really should listen. Um, if there's a sort of celebrity or they know, uh, uh, you know, people, then, uh, you know, there's a famous person or someone who's always uh, the from person, so to speak, in the emails or, or the letters, uh, the return address, then you should make sure that your uh, outreach comes from that person. That'll help inc increase uh, a response. Start with easy questions. So the hardest part about the survey is, well, of course, first to get people to open the, the envelope or to click on the email. And then when they get to that first question, you've got to build momentum. So you've got to start with a softball. Give them a, give them a layup, you know, let them slam dunk it so they get moving. Use uh, closed-ended questions. In, in, in other words, if you're, if, here's an example. If you're looking to understand how they might want to give or what they might want to support, make it closed-ended. Now, all, you can always give them a, a other kind of box where it pops open and, and, and gives them an open-ended opportunity to write some things. But generally, uh, you're going to want to have closed-ended questions instead of this kind of open, hey, what would you be interested in funding? I mean, don't make them think about it. Give them uh, the boxes to, to select. Use the word you. <laughs> Everything is about them. It's important. Uh, so, And because of that, it's important to use the word you in your copy so that it shows that you're focused on them. If you're using the word I, as much or even uh, even half as much as you use the word you, and you should count this, but if you use the word I often, that's a good sign that you're going to have a problem with your completion rates. Um, sometimes it's good to use a sense of urgency to put a deadline on there, and it's not a mean deadline. It's just saying, that, you know, we'd really appreciate your response by a certain date. Uh, that just implies that, yeah, you mean business and you'd really like to get their response by that date. Um, 
if there is a true sense of urgency, a true reason of, for urgency, then of course mention that too. That'll that'll really help. Um, make it easy for them to contact you. You should have your phone number and an email link. You know, even if it goes to like an info at or or um, uh, donate at kind of address, but make it e let them contact you. I heard a story one time of a, of a fundraiser that uh, some, some really big major donor was, was starting to take the survey. And then he, he saw there's a phone number there in the top right corner. And he just thought, you know what, I'm just going to call him. So he called the fundraiser and said, you know what, I'll just answer the survey here. I'll, I'll answer it for you. Let's have a talk. And he went through it and he answered all the questions and he ended up having a conversation and giving <laughs> right there on the spot. Um, Include a link if you have a privacy policy. This is not as important, but you might um, you might want to include it. it it's, a, it's a good best practice. Also, um, having touchy questions, especially things like age, uh, demographics, you might want to include at the very end. And then most important, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, is to employ something called back-end form filling, which is really something only that Market Smart does. So it'll sound a little bit salesy when I'm explaining what that is, uh, but it massively, it is actually the biggest reason for the high completion rates that we get over here. A couple of quick bonus ideas on how to get the best results is um, to allow people to actually update their contact information. So we end up with about 9% it's a high number. It's about 9% of people will update their contact information. That means their address, uh, their phone number, their email address. They may let you know that, um, uh, sadly, uh, Mr. Watson is no longer with us, and it's only Mrs. Watson now, things like that. Uh, also, let them opt in for more communications. Give them opportunities after the survey to uh, sign up for emails or uh, drip drip marketing, um, cultivation emails, advocacy alerts if, if, if that's appropriate. Uh, um, let them donate. Let them download information, uh, especially as it re um, relates to how they answer the question. So it's, it's, if you're using the online channel, you'll want to make it so that the pages that appear, the subsequent pages that pop up immediately after they take the survey are highly relevant and uh, provide ebooks or annual reports or videos or links to other things that um, pertain specifically to them based on how they answered uh, the questions in the survey. And that should all be automatic, automatic, bang, nice seamless experience. Um, okay, so preparing for the, the survey, you're going to want to create cheat sheets for your staff, so to speak. You know, think through what kinds of uh, calls you might get or what kinds of outbound calls you're going to want to make and role play with one another. Um, for instance, when I say role playing, I mean, the, the easiest thing to do, frankly, easiest thing to do when you get survey responses is to call the respondents and thank them for doing it and and ask and just say I, i'm so thrilled that you filled this out and it, it says here in the survey that you were a graduate on such and such a date or you were interested in x y and z you know point out something that they said make sure you let them know that they you saw it and that's how you know. And then after you point that out, then say, I wonder if you could just tell me a little more about that. Leave an open-ended kind of question. And, uh, and, and then off you go. Off you go. It's that easy. It opens the doors. People love to talk about themselves. Um, another thing before the survey, really important, is to warn other departments. You don't want them to get caught off guard uh, if if a phone starts ringing or or something happens. Uh, just make sure, like if you're in major gifts and you do this survey and uh, you didn't tell the plan gift folks about it, that's you know you're going to want to let them know. They may get a call from a supporter or vice versa. All right. 
um, after the survey, um, you're going to want to respond to everybody. So I already talked about that. But the key is prioritization, and that comes from analyzing the data. And it's best if you can get the data in real time uh, and analyze it as quick as possible. Because in my experience, you're going to get a lot of responses, and you're going to want to prioritize them. Not everybody's going to actually want a response or deserve a response. Uh, so, so you're going to want to look at that and prioritize easily who should get your outreach. Uh, so you, you can also, after you've done all your responses, you can create plans uh, after analyzing the data for going forward over a long-term plan. And especially if it's a capital campaign, you're going to end up with um, uh, fantastic plans. All right. Oh, and by the way, okay, Eric thanked me for answering his question earlier. Glad to hear it. Glad you like that. Okay, sorry, I just hit the button here. Funny. Um, let me go backwards. Okay, so after the survey, sorry, I'm going backwards and forwards. You're going to want to engage with everybody, set meetings, um, reach out to referrals, which by the way, one of your questions in your survey should be uh, if to ask people if they know anybody who appreciates the mission of your institution also. Uh, th those referrals are very, very powerful. Um, they work in private sector and they're going to work in, in major giving. Uh, that, In fact, that's how we get board members to help us is, is by referring others. So um, you're going to want to reach out to those folks. And very, very important, you're going to want to reach out to your legacy society disclosures is what I call them. So that's when we unearth the those hidden legacy gifts that we didn't know about. And the cool thing about this, and this is based on uh, my friend Dr. Russell James's research of 20 years of data, and what he found was that the average annual gift prior to making a planned gift average was only $4,200, but after making a planned gift rose and again, this is over 20 years of, of I, I, I forget how many hundreds of thousands of people in there in the study, but it rose by 75%. So stewarding those uh, supporters that said that they had left a gift in their will is very, very important. All right, so after the survey, you're going to respond to everyone, analyze the data and all that, and you're going to engage, you're going to legacy, steward the legacy supporters, and you're going to cultivate the, um, the, the other leads. The people who do not want to engage with you right now, uh, you're going to want to segment them and to buckets, so to speak, based on where they are in the consideration process, why they care, and, um, and their interests to create offers that will resonate with them. So um, again, now I got a, ahead of myself by answering the question earlier in talking about optimizing resources, uh, but now I'm going to fill in some, uh, some holes in that discussion because uh, I don't really, if any of you know me and read my blog, uh, I don't really, um, uh, I'm not a big fan of the donor pyramid, so to speak. I am a marketer and I, I do come from the private sector, so I apologize if that ruffles anybody's feathers. But the, um, uh, the funnel, I think, kind of looks like this. If we're going to go from left to right, is someone might be aware of the opportunity to find meaning in their life by giving and being philanthropic. And then they'll become interested. And uh, soon, if they have a burning desire, thanks to your, your education and, and, and relationship building, you'll move them to take action. Uh, they may stop giving if they're not stewarded properly and they'll reconsider the relationship. And then the blue part uh, really shows uh, essentially what happens with legacy gift people because they can change their mind. And in fact, uh, many do. Uh, the research from Dr. James shows that in the last four years of life is when these uh, estate plans become most turbulent. So people can kick you out of their will or kick out another charity and increase the size of your gift. So it really, um, the reconsider. I, I guess we'll call this the consideration continuum. It kind of never ends. And we're going to want to uh, build and strengthen relationships all along, but it's really in the action stage where we're going to close gifts. And for legacy uh, um, uh, decision makers, 
they can change their mind and uh, close a gift without you even knowing about it. So it's important that that we are um, sort of engaging with those folks over long periods of time so that we can unearth those gifts and steward them properly while they're alive. Now, the key to optimizing resources, and I have to give credit to my friends at Food for the Poor, which is a billion dollar uh, organization, a great organization down in Florida, based in Florida. And um, um, Glenn down there, the, the, the senior VP, he says um, the survey, and especially, of course, he's talking about us, thankfully, is that uh, it's the best um, employee optimization tool he's ever found. And what he means by that is that it, it enables him to put the right staff in the right place at the right time with the right people. And, and that's very important. The fishing expeditions are just too, too expensive. We want to fish where the fish are hungry and where they are big. So um, that takes me to the 80-20 rule, with which all of you are probably familiar with, the Pareto principle, which was uh, that just 20% of the people in Italy uh, was discovered by Pareto. Just 20% of those people owned 80% of the land, and that later became the 80-20 rule. And that's what we kind of focus on in major gifts generally, and frankly should also focus on that in plan giving, although um, almost anybody can make a plan gift, but the data shows that 80% of your plan gift revenue will come from about 20% of your planned gift donors. If you don't believe me, go ahead and pull your data and let me know what you find. I have generally found that it's always 80% of your, your plan gift dollars come from just 20% of the people. Um, so, so I recommend that your objective be to focus on capacity how, and, 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 and look at how people would like to support their interests and then look at where people reside in the consideration process, uh, which I like to call the donor journey. Uh, the next level is really looking at passions and interests. So uh, what this means is, is looking at their life story and understanding why they care for the purposes of prioritization and also looking at their interests and how, uh, what they'd like to support, how they'd like to give. Now, am I saying that prospect research is like out the window? Well, absolutely not. I mean, it's very important. You're still going to want to look at frequency of giving and recency of giving, longevity, all that stuff is, is still important. But I, I have to tell you that uh, that's good for prospect research. What we're talking about is lead generation, lead qualification, and caseload optimization. OK, uh, so uh, and this is also aligned with the prospect research. You might be able to get well screening, although it's highly uh, it's just not perfect. Uh, predictive analytics is, is 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 good. These are all great. In fact, all of this prospect research stuff helps us to increase our response rates for surveys. But in the end, uh, to get a, a 360 degree profile of the donor, meaning who they are and why they care, it can really, uh, the, I believe I'm biased here, but it comes from the survey feedback, which shows you how they want to engage, how they want to be involved. Do they want to volunteer and, or even join the board? I mean, volunteerism is like the gateway drug to uh, major giving. Um, so if you can get a high capacity person who answered a, a survey saying they want to volunteer and then you get them involved in volunteering, that's going to be very, a very powerful way to get them to give. Um, family oriented connections, of course, are powerful. Pa whoops, pa passion levels. Um, uh, monitoring and understanding their level of commitment and passion and how your institution ranks compared to the other charities that they support is very important. Uh, learning why they care. Childlessness. Childlessness. Legacy gifts among people who are childless uh, tend to be, I think, about four times greater. It's very important to understand that. And you cannot buy, by the way, all, a lot of this information that's here on this list, you can't buy it. You can only get it directly from the donor. 
Um, you may be able to buy ages. It may not be accurate. Level of education, hopefully you have that. Uh, but how about whether or not they own, uh, I shouldn't say own because they don't own a DAF, but they, they put their money in a donor advised fund or a family foundation. Uh, that's a very good sign of capacity and philanthropic intent. But uh, how about their likelihood to give? You know, their interest in giving to you and their interest in giving you referrals. All these things are powerful qualifiers. So I'm going to try and show you a little bit of how I recommend that you build caseloads with this. It's just my recommendation. Um, so imagine that you're looking at a part of your funnel I, or your pyramid, I should say, and let's uh, just for round figures, you take 100,000 supporters out of there. It could be 10,000. I've even seen some people do as little as 1,000. And um, you could look at it based on recency and frequency giving, monetary value, all that. I always recommend you go a little further and wider rather than super narrow, especially if you're using the digital channel because that's inexpensive. And um, you're going to want to pull that data and then uh, per perhaps zero in on 20,000 that, that you think have capacity. Okay. Again, if you want to go to all 100,000 and you have the money to do it, you know, more power to you. But remember that you only have so many gift officers. So our average is about 9% for total response rate. It's a little higher than 9% uh, for all of our clients, which is actually humongous. Um, and for uh, colleges and universities, and I think it's in this deck, we'll get to it, is, is I believe a little over 11%. Um, so better than the average. Now, you got to realize that it's pretty hard to even get people to open an email or open a letter. Uh, and op and to click on it or fill out a survey or to uh, respond to a survey. Uh, but uh, like I said, uh, we've kind of cracked the code on it. So you may be able to expect a 2 or 3% response rate. I'm just kind of throwing out a number of what I've heard from others. But um, our, our number is generally around 9%. So that's why I put I, I actually made it 10%. I split the difference. And so 2000 uh, 20,000 potential with capacity you outreach uh, reach out to them and you get 2000 responses and then you're going to want to assign caseloads so if you have 10 fundraisers on staff you're going to probably take about 150 for each of them and there's going to be different levels of priority the top priority are going to be the A's and that'll probably be about 10 of them and 50 will be the B's and then there's going to be the rest and that'll assign 1500 but then you're going to have 500 left over, and that's because as you uh, as you go through these, you're probably going to want to churn the caseloads a little bit. And uh, you know, as as you make your calls, some of these are going to fall out, and you're going to want to replace them. So look, this is not a hard fast rule. I'm just trying to show you a, a general concept of how you can use this to uh, develop a caseload and, and optimize it over time. The key to it and the thing that's really beautiful is that you're no longer qualifying donors. They're qualifying themselves. And there's just nothing better than that. Self-qualification is so much better. All right, so now I'm going to, um, oh, okay, there's the, we're going to jump in a little more specific about colleges and universities. And uh, yeah, so there's our average response rate as it stands today. It's 11.67%. Um, please, if, if your list is not uh, as clean and, and whatnot and you ever buy from us, then please don't get mad at me. If you only get a 7% response rate, I, I promise you, you'll probably still be happy anyway. Uh, and oh, and there's our average um, for the rest of the company, uh, for the rest of the, the clients is 8.93%. So I, I think I said 9%. It bounces up and down. The average number of qualified leads we generate is 590. Of course, if you're doing a, if you're, it, that depends on how many you're sending out. And uh, <clears throat> the average number of legacy gifts we find and un uncover is 43 which is a, just a massive number, especially when you consider the annual fund revenue that you'll get as you steward them properly, uh, as I mentioned before with Dr. James' research with that increase. Okay, so now, fortunately, and here, let me make sure I pull up. Yes. Whoops. Hang on just a second there. Thank you for your patience. Yes, I had the right one. So this is my friends over at Benedictine College. Um, 
I'm going to kind of go through some of their pages, uh, but I'm not going to go through the whole thing because it might bore you and we're already uh, past an hour. So I'm going to buzz through this and uh, point out some key aspects of it is that the uh, logo is branded. The contact information is there and it's easy to see it. They can, um, they can link to their social media on the right hand side there. We've used a progress bar to make it really easy to understand where they are in the process of taking this and a big, big next button on the right hand side. We mentioned that we can't do it without you. We need your responses. And we always include a tax ID. I probably should have included that on an earlier slide because you just never know who's going to get this and think that they might need that for a, um, uh, for a legacy gift and they could just give that to their attorney. So it really doesn't take up much space to just include that. Um, finding out whether or not there's been an influential person in someone's life is really, really important. So the science of this comes from, uh, well, at least where I learned it is from Robert Cialdini's book uh, called Influence. And if you haven't read this book, it is, I think, one of the best books in the world of marketing, fundraising, advertising, anything. Uh, I This, to me, is a must read for probably almost every human being on earth <laughs> because it teaches you the uh, principles of persuasion. What we learn from this book that applies to the reason why we ask for the name of an influential person with whom uh, the supporter might have a relationship is because once that person responds and types that name in there, they plant a seed in their mind that, that reminds them uh, that at all the subsequent questions that will be asked, which are mostly about giving, it sort of ties that person indelibly into their mind and not only uh, in association with giving, but it also, the longer um, time goes on, the more, as, as Cialdini calls it, he says, the, the roots grow in the concept. So if you first um, connect the dots like that, people's subconscious thinks about it in such a way that allows for the concept, the idea of giving in honor of this person, or even if they never mention it when they give, uh, it's there. And it's a powerful influencer for their reason for giving. And uh, the more you can get them to reassert that, the more it will grow. It will grow on its own, but the more you get them to reassert it, or if you bring it up in a meeting because they filled it out in this survey, it will only connect the dots and help you um, build that relationship uh, and, and move towards the giving part of the relationship that much faster. So I hope I'm not getting too geeky on the psychology. Other things are, you're, I'm skipping to question five here, and you can see you want to find out what people's interests are, and especially how they want to give and what is their likelihood of giving in certain ways. That's really powerful, and this is where we understand the, uh, the, the consideration continuum. People will move up and down or uh, from left to right in this consideration continuum. Um, sometimes people will say that they're not likely to give jewelry, but then a couple years later that they are. Uh, that they might not want to give to the capital campaign, but a uh, year later they are. So people change their minds. It's unbelievable. It's never set in stone. And the same thing happens with the legacy gift kind of question. Find out if they're interested or if they might possibly be interested or if they've already left a gift. Then, of course, the very powerful to make sure you get that seed planted and anchored with its roots to find out who they may be be doing this in honor of. Very important for stewardship. Um, and then finally, you always want to include some kind of a, um, uh, a open box for people to just tell you. And, and it's amazing what people will say in these open boxes. Uh, finally, you'll want to get some demographics, including, of course, you're going to want to find out if they have children in uh, at all. Not presence of children, by the way. It's not about presence of children in the household, which is data you could buy. But most of your supporters are going to be past that stage where there's no children in there. Now, 
at the very end, I promised you that I was going to talk to you about backfill form, back backfill forms. Uh, backfilling the forms is is really what we have uh, cracked uh, uh, some technology on because uh, it's it increases response rates massively. If you pre-fill the last page of the survey then people will either update their information and, um, and so on. But more importantly, the likelihood that they'll actually finish the survey goes up. If you don't have the backfill technology, it's not going to be a deal breaker. I mean, you'll still get responses. It's just that uh, then people are going to need to type in their stuff and they may second guess it. But if it's already there, then um, it, your chances of, of going on, and, and for us, it's very, very high. It's very rare that people bounce at this stage. All right, so we're getting close to the end here, and then I'll give you my warning about us uh, showing off our, our stuff, our dashboard and whatnot. But uh, the pros and cons of various media channels, you have to understand that uh, you're looking at uh, some media channels are just plain going to cost more than others. So if you're going to do donor discovery face-to-face, -face, I get it. It's very powerful. It's amazing what you'll learn from people, but it's going to be expensive. Direct mail comes down from there. I should have included telemarketing as well. Uh, but then when you get to the digital channels, of course, the, uh, the costs go down. Other ways, though, if you're in the digital realm, you can ask people to take the survey right after they give a donation online. You know, thanks so much for your donation. Take the survey. How about on their tax receipts, a little box or just some, you know, or an insert or something that says, hey, go online, take our survey. This can be applied to everybody because it's inexpensive to do. Could be a pop-up online as they're exiting your website. So once they leave your website, boom, just before they go away, it says, hey, wait, before you go away and you go on uh, ESPN.com, why not take our online survey? Uh, retargeting ads, that's those ads that kind of follow you around a little bit. You know, you, you go on Amazon.com, you're shopping for a vacuum cleaner. Next thing you know, you see ads for a vacuum cleaner. Well, you could do that kind of advertising too, but it's not selling anything. It's just that, well, they visited your site. Perhaps they were looking at tickets to the next football game or something. And then um, if you do this right, when they leave and they go on the other websites for the next day or two, they could get ads asking them to take your survey. Also, including a little box or something in your survey, in your newsletters, or really any other communications. You can make this completely ubiquitous that you're always asking people to take the survey and uh, you'll get a constant stream of leads. Now, of course, since you're not targeting in that respect, you're going to get a lot of leads that are unqualified uh, for major giving, but that's okay. That's okay. Um, and this, uh, okay, so sorry, I'm just. Uh, showing that I still believe in print. <laughs> I know I talk a lot about digital, but print is very value, valuable and powerful. Uh, it does create some, some issues because then someone has to enter the information in and things like that. But it's it, especially for older, very older donors that aren't um, digitally uh, responsive, you're going to want to use print. Now, putting it all together, I'm going to show you some low-cost ways and then I'll finally wrap this up and we'll get into questions. But some low cost ways to do surveys is really to just ask your board and volunteers. And that means just give them like a letter and give them a survey and maybe even with an insert about uh, the fact that they can make a beneficiary designation change and leave you a legacy gift. I don't know if you want to be that forward, but just give them a uh, uh, just give it at the next board meeting. Just put it there in in their agenda. You know, in the envelope that has all the, the things that or the, the three ring binder, whatever you're going to go over, um, include that as, as a 10 minute or five minute, two minute exercise. Um, if you're going to do the digital end yourself, you can use any of a number of, of tools. Um, SurveyMonkey is kind of popular. Other lesser known is Voxco. And believe it or not, Google even has uh, survey technology. 
you'd then want to use your email um, system, whatever you're using for fundraising. But if you if you don't have access to that, then you can use you know any of a number of hundreds of different kinds of email systems. All right. So now this is the point where I get to tell you that hey, I'm going to talk about Market Smart. And I'm going to talk about what we do. So this is going to get into a little bit of a sales pitch. If you want a complete demonstration, I recommend that you um, get a demo with one of our solutionists. We don't have salespeople. We call them solutionists because uh, their job is not to sell you, but to help you come to a solid solution on your own. And um, so you can uh, feel free to bounce now. I'm going to call it in like three seconds, two one, all right, I gave you fair warning. Now I'm going into the sales part just a little bit here. Um, this is the way we, we, we do it here is that we'll, um, we'll survey supporters with either print or online. And then our artificial intelligence will actually take the data in real time and think about it to be able to help qualify who is um, uh, uh, worth, uh, I shouldn't say worth, but who is uh, the most high-ranking pri uh, prioritized lead, most highly qualified lead, I should say. And um, for all of your leads, especially the ones that you can't get to or won't get to because they're not entirely qualified, uh, the, the system uh, segments the data and um, kicks off automatically uh, email cultivation um, uh, communications that are highly relevant and appropriate for where people are in the uh, donor journey, in the consideration continuum. So those emails will drip over time at appropriate rates based on uh, their level of passion and interest and, and uh, where they are in the donor journey and help people to move themselves through the consideration process. Now, I'm not a big fan of saying that they will move people. I don't like the phrase moves management. I don't think as a donor, personally, I don't like the idea that someone's going to move me, but I do like the idea that someone is facilitating my ability to move myself. So that's a little bit of, um, um, I'm just kind of playing on the words a little bit, but it is important to me that the drips should be engaging and should help people to move themselves through the process. And then all of the uh, engagements, the clicks, the interactions that happen with a supporter will uh, get, sh get um, presented online in our dashboard. So another way to look at this, <clears throat> excuse me, is that here's a fundraiser and the institution, uh, the website and, and your Twitter and all this and your database. So our system actually operates completely outside of all that so that you don't have to get into fights with the digital department and, and, and everybody else. And, and we can get things running fast. And the artificial intelligence thinks about it and then creates these emails, which by the way, always have uh, links in them because we want people to click on them. And those links drive people to what I like to call a red velvet rope section, or maybe we could call it the first section, uh, first class section of an airplane. Um, or maybe another way is, um, I don't know, we'll call it the VIP area which is a separate kind of microsite that is intended just for people who want to find meaning in their lives, lives through giving. And I'm talking major gifts and legacy gifts. There really isn't a, a very good dedicated space online for most of these kinds of people, people who want to find meaning. Now, I have seen there's plenty of these um, uh, kind of cookie cutter planned giving sites that are often written by lawyers and are very legalese and fairly complex um, and are usually geared for helping people actually just take action, but they're not particular, and that's a very small percentage of the uh, uh, the people who will need to be cultivated. Not everybody's ready to take action. Uh, the real way to create this VIP section is so that it, it is helpful for people who want to take action now, but mostly it's there to support the consideration process for someone who wants to be philanthropic and find meaning in their lives in that way. Um, so uh, that's kind of the overarching way to do it, but a lot of folks will do what I call a power pilot 
project whereby we'll do a survey, we'll uh, create just four drips, just four drip emails, and then the, 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 whole, the project is over and we analyze it and then folks will decide whether or not they want to go forward with um, building out the whole system that includes that, that awesome VIP section. And uh, these drips may be first a thank you, it could be like maybe a checklist or uh, a quiz, and then finally an invitation for lunch, which of course the people who respond to that are, uh, I mean, that those are the best leads. You love it when people just respond and say, yes, I do want to visit with you. That would be great. So of course, all the data gets into the dashboard and then away you go on your meetings and closing more gifts at a much, much higher rate. So that leaves us with the final component, and I'm going to show you the dashboard uh, really briefly. And um, thankfully, my friends at Benedictine said that I can show you one, and I'm just toggling to make sure that all the data is anonymous. Uh, this is our dashboard, and uh, it will show you how many people have left legacy gifts or at least come forward, how many people are considering it how many people might consider it, and of course people who say that they will not consider it, which by the way changes over time. We also have a mapping tool to help for plotting um, uh, visits, especially creating those anchor visits, and it's fun to see who, uh, who says that your charity is their top choice for giving, and frankly those who say that you, they will not give. And then you can see, since most um, uh, most folks have no idea who's visiting their website, uh, what we do is we make it so that you do know who's visiting your website by name. But this shows you just the the general pulse of these uh, these particular people who have self qualified and opted in, and who is uh, visiting the website on these days. Now, if you have, for instance, one of those uh, uh, the the cookie cutter plan giving sites, you can never really see. Well, first of all, they don't usually get much traffic because they don't have automated uh, cultivation email system, uh, and people just generally don't visit those sites. And I've seen the data that proves that. But if you have an automated drip email system or other kinds of cultivation, you will get um, lots of people visiting your sites regularly. Your pages, I should say. What you'll want to do is is look at people in here to determine how recently people have visited. Of course, red means that they're hot, orange means they're kind of cooling off, and you're going to want to look at their score. So you can sort by score, or you can sort by recency, or a little bit of both. Um, so I'm going to take a look at this guy because he's kind of hot. He's got a high score. Of course, his name is only James. That's all you can see. And um, we're going to go all the way down to his first survey that was filled out was a couple of years ago, over two years ago now. And we can see some interesting information, of course, about his age and he has no children. Um, he says he's not interested in a legacy gift and so on. But we've learned some stuff, and then over time, in fact, afterward, we sent an offer for him to see uh, how others have responded to the survey, and he got a report that shows all that information, so that's good. And then the following year, I guess that's 2016, in August, another year later, he took the survey again, thankfully. And uh, now he starts telling us, uh, well, interestingly, okay, this is cool, is that before he said he is not interested in making a legacy gift, but one year later he says, not now, but in the future I might possibly be interested. So he's moved himself um, forward in the consideration stage. That's terrific, in fact, especially since he has no children and he's kind of the ripe, ripe age. Uh, he's also told us that uh, he's not interested in giving property and things like this, but he would be somewhat likely to talk to a gift officer face to face or by telephone. I'd say that's a good qualifier. He mails checks and, and whatnot. So, yeah, and he's somewhat likely to give to the capital campaign. That's this is fantastic. So he's warming up over time. And we could probably see this in what I call the digital body language. So I'm going to go all the way back to 2015, since he's been getting a lot of emails after um, he opted in from the survey. 
And you'll see, and it's an interesting thing to let you know, is after someone takes the survey, what we find is they generally don't respond to very many emails in the very beginning. But then all of a sudden, when they start responding, look at all this. I mean, he's ignoring a lot of stuff, frankly. He's ignoring for almost a year until, uh, oh, until he got that offer to see the results of the survey. That's great. He liked that offer. He responded to that. And then going forward, well, he started responding again to the next survey. And he responded to the results. He liked that report again. And in fact, and then he started clicking on donor stories. And he engaged with the blog. And then Giving Societies, that's a legacy giving society. He looked at the results again. And you can see that the people gain momentum in their engagement if you're not always badgering them, asking them for money. So now he's engaging with the stories up until I think we're at the recent yeah, June 19th, most recently, that's why he's red hot, is because he engaged um, just uh, yesterday, I guess that is. So now we can see for prioritization purposes, um, you know, some of the pluses, and we don't give away our algorithm that gave him that score of 820, but we do show you the pluses and minuses. We can see he started off with a big minus here. He was not interested in considering a, a legacy gift, but now, of course, he has uh, changed his position on that, which is fantastic. So he's getting some a lot of pluses now, and those pluses are increasing his score. Uh, just a couple other cool things about the, the dashboard is you're able to export just about anything you want, any kind of data uh, to create lists that you want from here, and it's really easy, but we train and we'll teach you as much as you want. And then uh, you get tons and tons of reports to be able to see what's going on and to be able to report to your board um, the kinds of uh, uh, results that you're getting. But of course, our staff also will prepare PowerPoints for you, no problem. And then finally, uh, the mapping tool, which is really fun for me, but you can um, really zero in on people to see here, I'm going to try and stay in the US. And um, I don't know, someone said that they were in Colorado. So we'll just kind of go in there and uh, see if we can. And I know this is going to seem kind of freaky to some of you, um, but welcome to the internet. It's, uh, this is where we are these days. And we can always, of course, just zoom in on uh, a neighborhood and take a look and see, um, you know, what their home looks like. It's actually a very nice, nice place to be. So that wraps it up. I'm going to uh, move on to taking questions at this point. And I appreciate that uh, it looks like we only lost about 10 people. <laughs> so now I'm going to go jump into the questions. There's uh, quite a few in here, not that many, but but good enough. Um, so the slides, we will have the slides, not all of them. It's a very big file, and frankly, we don't give away all of the questions and everything that we ask. Um, we hope that you'll uh, want to work with us on that. Uh, I hope I've given you enough value, but um, unfortunately, we don't give all that completely away. But um, another question here is... Um, how many years after graduation should I start to include alumni in surveys? Wow, that is a good question. So um, I think that you can actually start surveying people right away. I don't see a reason not to, but just remember that uh, the new alumni will probably not be uh, major gift prospects. But I think the earlier that you can learn about them and develop a relationship with them, the better. So um, it depends on what, what department you work in and what the objective is but it, and, and what level, what kind of budget you have. Uh, but the, uh, that, that's, uh, I, I never see a problem with asking people uh, questions like that. Okay, let's see if we have other questions. Bear with me just a second. 
Well, actually, I thought these were more questions, but I don't see any more. So I'm just going to hold on for another minute and see if any others pop up. But otherwise, oh, okay, here they come. What would be the biggest benefit to an organization who's restarting their program? So, John, uh, I'm not sure which program you mean. If Maybe it's a major gift program or is it a legacy gift program, uh, if you don't mind letting me know. But the biggest benefit I can tell without seeing your answer to that question yet, is uh, really in generating leads and opportunities for engagement at a high, high level with people who want to have that level of uh, relationship. So uh, the hardest part, I, I would say, and maybe someone will comment on here, is that at least 50, maybe upwards of 80%, of your effort is going to be spent just trying to get meetings with new uh, new potential donors, and if it's that hard to get those meetings, um, and you're you're spending most of your time on that, I would think you'd prefer to spend more of your time talking to donors about giving and and about their their passions and interests than um, about uh, spending your time trying to get them to meet with you. So the trick here is uh, is the biggest benefit is that this massively truncates the um, the amount of time and cost associated with that to to have serious conversations with people. Okay, more. Um, oh, what would be the biggest? Okay benefit to an organization restarting their program to use our surveying service? Yeah, so I think I answered the question, I hope. And for plan giving, frankly, John, uh, the biggest benefit, I, I believe, it has a twist to it, is that you'll not only find leads, but you will uncover legacy gifts that you didn't know existed, and that'll give you the opportunity to, to steward them and increase the size of those legacy gifts and uh, increase their annual fund giving over time. Um, so, Betty entered the meeting late. May I have the recording? Yes, everybody will get the recording. Uh, let's see. Is this cost effective for an organization with less than 1,000 donors? So, we, the smallest we've ever done was a, an organization that only had 800 on their list. It did work. Believe it or not, we ended up finding 26 legacy gifts. It was astounding. It was a Jewish federation in um, uh, some part of Virginia, not Northern Virginia, uh, Tidewater, Virginia. So frankly, I don't know where that is, but I don't think it's a big town. Uh, so it, it, the, the, it's only worth it cost effective if the prospects on your list are very passionate and if they have capacity. So um, if these are low dollar donors and they don't have a lot of money, I I, I don't recommend going forward with um, with our service. But you could certainly do a survey, of course, on your own. Um, but but if you have passionate supporters and they have some degree of capacity, you're gonna you're gonna do very well. Um, and often just one gift will more than pay for uh, the service that we provide. Um, how did you identify the 2,000 prospects with capacity to take the survey? What are the defining characteristics? Yeah, that is, uh, I'm assuming, and of course, that was a very loose model I was using there, but um, the capacity, I would think, would be based on some wealth screening or some past giving history. So, for instance, if they've given $1,000 or $5,000 in the past, I've just got to assume that they've got some level of capacity. Um, maybe also looking at recency and frequency of their gifts. So, looking at the lifetime value of their giving, not only uh, if they gave a $1,000 or $5,000 gift, but maybe over seven years if they've given a total of $5,000, that can be telling. Uh, but, but yeah, and that's why I was saying at the beginning that you don't have to just reach out to the 2000, uh, or I'm sorry, the 20,000, you can go further and wider, especially with, uh, digital channels. Okay. More are rolling in. So Betty, thank you. I also would like my Dean to see and hear your webinar. So a recording would be most helpful. Of course. My pleasure, Betty. Um, should an organization segment how their donors survey 
is distributed, such as for print, uh, for the older generations versus digital for the younger? Yes and no. Um, I recommend, in fact, a little twist on that to perhaps conduct the digital survey first and then do a second sweep for print because we should not make decisions for older or younger generations and determine whether or not they're likely to respond. Let's let the supporters make the decision whether they want to respond by one channel or another. Now, if you can afford to do both, I would start with the oldest of, of, um, of your, your audience and keep going down in age, if you have their ages, until you uh, expend your budget on print. So in other words, when you're finished and you, you, you can only go down to a certain age level and then boom, your budget for print is done. Uh, that's how I would do it. The key, the, the thing is that if you uh, uh, send a survey out to people and you use multiple channels, meaning uh, email, for instance, and um, uh, print, th there are two channels. One plus one, though, does not equal two in the in the marketing world when you use multi multiple channels one plus one equals actually five we've seen much higher response rates with people who get it from multiple channels so uh, to the degree that you ha have that kind of budget I, I seriously recommend trying to do multiple channels as much as possible um, the last Answer well the last question, then I'm going to wrap it up, and I thank you all for staying tuned. This is the last question, but the minimum number of alums that we work with, and I okay, so I think I kind of answered this before. The lowest that we've ever done is about 800, uh, but it all depends on the quality of your list. So if they are passionate and involved and engaged or um, uh, have capacity, then you're uh, it's going to be worthwhile. Uh, but frankly, you could probably do just fine by just uh, supplying a survey to your board members or your committee members. Uh, you could just start there at very low cost and, and get a tremendous benefit from it. And, and honestly, you, from the results of that, you could probably get a board member to fund the survey effort, which I've seen. Uh, so getting them to be believers in it first because they took it and it helped them uh, think about how they want to find meaning in their life is very powerful. And then you'll probably get the budget to go forward. So with that, I thank you so much for joining me today. Again, my name is Greg Warner. I'm the CEO and founder of Market Smart, and I'm really thrilled to have had you here. I hope you gained value. So thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.